as a trainer, when you own your own business, clients, it's not like they sign up and they're like 10 years. It could be six months, it could be three, it could be two weeks, it could yep. be two years, right? So you don't always know how long somebody's gonna be with you. Your job as a trainer is to train them so that they can be on their own and grow. Unless they have a ton of money and they're like, I can grow but still pay you to be here. Right. Also great, right? Yeah. Welcome back to the Business Playground. It's your host, Jacob O'Dell. And today I have the honor of speaking with Morgan Reese, who is one of the top trainers in Los Angeles, or at least I think so to my extent because of her client reviews, the things that I've seen about her online and her just dedication to personal training overall. And we're gonna dive into various topics today, mainly about being a female in Los Angeles and in this industry. And then also about the back end of being a personal trainer, some of the stuff that not a lot of people online are talking about, where you know pricing, structures, how everything is, and then also about her just growing as an individual. So Morgan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So I wanna just right out of the bat, I want you to give me a little bit of description about you and some of the challenges that you faced coming up and where you originated from before you got to LA. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm a girl from the Midwest. So I'm from Indiana, Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. And I knew that after college, I wanted to, number one, get out of Indianapolis. So that was the first goal. And after I graduated with my bachelor's in kinesiology, um, I set my sights on LA. I knew I was going to LA. I just didn't know exactly how I was going to do it or where I was going to work. Um, but once I sent out my resume and I had a couple of places I wanted to work, at, I wanted to avoid the corporate setting and wanted to work at more of an independent gym setting, which we really don't have a lot of in the Midwest, mm -hmm. which is why I wanted to leave there. I knew I would have more opportunity and, and a bit more freedom in LA. So once I moved out here, I worked for an independent gym. And after that, you it depends on how long you want to stay there. But once you have your clientele and your roster, then you slowly migrate into becoming an independent trainer. That's always the end goal out here. Mm -hmm. You just don't really have a lot of guidance coming from the Midwest. There's no class on how to leave here or how to, how to become successful in a bigger city. Sure. And even though my degree was in kinesiology, we even had a business class, but that didn't cover anything about being an independent trainer and owning your own business. This is definitely something in our generation that is coming up now. The generation before us, which you have a lot of male celebrity trainers mm -hmm. that are in their late 40s, 50s, they are from the generation of no social media and they still are training celebrities. They are the kind of the pioneers of this industry, I would say, if your sights are set on training the elite, if mm -hmm. you will. So once I was here, I was definitely on my own yeah. in terms of figuring out how to do what I wanted to do. There's not a map. Um, I could now say that I have a map that I could sure. help people and guide people, but there's some trip ups along the way. So after working at an independent gym, I then, it's not like I decided to leave. I was kind of pushed out but it ended up being a good thing for me. A lot of my clients from that gym followed me and you pay almost like the best comparison really is a hairdresser. So you have hairdressers anywhere where they rent a booth and they have their clients, they charge their prices and whatever they charge is uh, taken out into their overhead of wherever they're working. Same concept with trainers. We just don't really do that in the Midwest. Yeah. So out here, you find a gym and you pay an overhead, either per session or monthly. You charge what you want for your clients in terms of what your worth is or what you believe your worth is. Mm -hmm. And you build from there. So that's what I started to do. And I think the biggest thing for me is having a dedicated group of clients that I had created deep uh, and loving connections with. They were dedicated to me. They were not swayed by staying behind at that gym because all they wanted to do was work with me. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, uh, they believed in me more than I did myself. So once I started going on my own and they stuck with me, that really taught me that I was worth all of this and I wanted to build my own uh, little castle. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And your little castle has definitely been growing yeah. into a bigger and bigger castle every single day. And 
what was your pricing when you first started out compared to now? And what's some pricing advice that you could give someone? So when I first started out, I think a timeline of this would help. So we're looking at 2018, 2019. Okay. I would say trainers, if you're looking in LA, um, even maybe New York, maybe Miami, not a lot of the smaller cities, minimum of $100 an hour. Uh, you're going to have to pay overhead to whatever gym you are working out of mm -hmm. uh, if you own your own business. So if you notice, in a lot of these corporate settings, they are charging $130 to $150 a session. Mm -hmm. The trainer is getting maybe $22 an hour while they're training someone. Right. When you're not training someone, you get minimum wage and you're just chilling on the floor. Uh, you could be working for 12 hours a day. It's It's not fair. It's not right. Yeah. So when you take it into your own hands, I always recommend keep in mind what were your clients paying when they were at the corporate gym when they met you. Right. That I did not think about right away. I thought, I feel bad. I don't want to charge them too much. Well, they were paying $135 an hour for me. Mm -hmm. Even though they couldn't afford it maybe long term, they were fine to throw down the credit card or throw down whatever they needed to to work with me. And that was before they even knew me. And now here they are leaving a gym in a comfortable environment and following me wherever I chose to go. So I highly recommend the first thing, because I do think with women, and I'm speaking as a woman, I don't know if men always go through this, but there's definitely that imposter syndrome mm -hmm. where you think, I feel bad, maybe I can't do this, I'm just starting out, I don't have this, maybe I shouldn't charge so much. Just think of what they were paying before. And if you don't want to charge as much, don't go below $100 an hour. So keep the $100 minimum. Don't do that to yourself. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So you may not believe that you should charge more, whatever it is. Don't go below $100. i will just give you that number right there. Um, the other part is continuing education immediately after. <laughs> once okay. you're building your own business, mm -hmm. You need to learn more. You're going to learn so much more once you're on your own. Do what you can in, in, in your other setting, but learn as much as possible. Um, and then you can add more to your price and you have uh, the resume to show it. So I would say for me, I started out, unfortunately, at like $85 an hour. Mm -hmm. And I regret that. I, if I was going to mentor someone now, I would say, cool, 100 Stick yeah. with it. And if you don't think you're worth $100, keep the 100 and work harder until you feel like you do. Learn more. You will start to work in an environment where you notice that you know a little bit more than other people. But when you're in a shell and you're being told what to do in a quota to meet, you don't always think that way. So yes, not, not below $100 an hour. Think about what your client was paying prior to. Ask some other independent trainers what they're charging. They know that you're learning. There's nothing wrong with asking someone. If they don't want to tell you, ask somebody else. That was a huge thing I learned. Celebrity trainers, $150 to $200 an hour. Some $250 or $300 if they're on retainer. For example, if they're working for an A-list celebrity where they travel with them. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you're starting out, $100 to $140 an hour, $150. Above that would be a goal to move on later, later down the road. Okay. So minimum, $100. And then moving forward, you can always do that based upon your learning capabilities and your education, your experience, of course. How has it been for you and your learning processes with the certifications of what should the certification process be for someone? And maybe what organizations do you recommend that they go through for these certifications? So the first thing we all know that as a personal trainer, you have your personal training certification. Boom done. You're going to have to continue to do uh, continued education anyway to maintain that certification. You have certain points that are required you, for you to do, whether it's reading material. You could even get another um, specialization certification mm -hmm. that's underneath that. I highly recommend you have your major uh, personal training certification. Find another focus, such as mobility. That would be a great one. Um, FRC, functional range and conditioning excellent resource for that. Unfortunately, it is expensive, 
But I promise you, as you go on in the industry, there's a lot of respect that is given towards someone who has an FRC certification. It bleeds a little bit into the physical therapy realm, mm -hmm. which is, of course, very important for a trainer to be aware of. We have prehab, rehab, and all those things. So other than your, your major personal certification, personal training certification, mobility would be one that I highly recommend. Another one is... Any certification that focuses on progressing and regressing your basic exercises. Something you will deal with with any client is giving them an exercise. Oh no, they can't do this well. Do I regress this? Well, how do I regress this? Mm -hmm. CFSC, Certified Functional Training Coach. So that one CFSC taught me very basic. Here's how you progress this exercise. Mm. Here's how you regress this exercise. And it could give you one or two options, either direction. Extremely important when you're working with general population. Um, other than mobility and then CFSC, I would say at that point, look into, are you wanting to further your athletic training certifications? Do you want to train athletes? Do you want to go into Pilates? That could be something interesting. Do you actually want to take a, the route of being a physical therapist or kind of working in that area? So I would say the major ones, personal training certification, FRC for your mobility, mm -hmm. CFSC, and they have different levels for that in terms of regressing and progressing exercises. Outside of that, take your time, Learn specialties that you want to know more about, things that you think you're really good at. Myofascial release. You can work on um, manually working with the body and the muscles. Clients will always love that. They want to leave feeling good. Stretching certifications. All of these things. If you went to yourself, what would you want from you that can do more than just one person? Does that make sense? Yeah. So if I'm going to go to someone and I go to a chiropractor and all they can do is adjust me, I don't get any muscle work. I don't get any in-depth like psychological conversations about myself. We also have a nutrition aspect. I'm gonna want all that from someone. So what would you want from you to feel the most understood with all of the things that, that a human being comes with? Wow, lots of different niche mm -hmm. avenues that you can take within just the personal training umbrella. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like a lot of people just focus on the personal trainer and then the nutritionist and that's it. Because in my case, that's exactly how I thought when I got my certification. Mm -hmm. So I got my personal training and uh, nutritionist certificates, um, did the courses, passed the, the class, got my certificate, did some personal training for, I want to say about three months, made some pretty good money doing it and then went off to college. Yeah. The only thing that I can say though is I wish I did the strength training program. I wish I did the mobility. I would end up reading books about it and be like, oh my gosh, like I totally should have just bought this course so that I can learn it and then take it into account. What I also want to jump into though is not only the certifications, but the people that you know within the industry, right? I feel that there is like this stigmatism that people don't want to approach the superior right? It's difficult to have a conversation with a trainer that's doing better than you mm -hmm. because of the fear factor, right? Are you ever intimidated by the people that you're trying to have these intellectual conversations with or ask advice about, or even when you first got started? What was that like? The first rule of thumb, mm -hmm. put yourself in an environment where you are surrounded by others that are better than you. And it's quite humbling but it also is inspirational and will help you want to be better. If you're the best person in the room all the time and you're always walking around, where's your ceiling? You mm -hmm. know, you've created this, this solid top for yourself. Where do you go after that? You don't want to always be the best. So yes, I'm absolutely intimidated by trainers that are more successful, that have the clients that I wish I had, or had the education that I wish I had. But they had to start somewhere as well. They have been where I have been. I have not even reached some places that they have surpassed. So with that being said, yes, there may be some intimidation factors, 
But if you humble yourself and you present yourself as willing to learn, Mm -hmm. wanting to understand, most trainers will open up and give plenty of advice because they understand how hard it is. And there are some things we're going to know that they may not, especially if they're further down the road in terms of social media and technology. So there's nothing wrong with asking someone else what they charge. What were the steps that they took to become where they are? How did they end up training a celebrity? How did they meet this person, right? Mm -hmm. There are so many different ways that some of it's luck. That's fair. Some Mm -hmm. of it is luck. Some of it is who they knew. Some of it was a chance meeting. I've even met trainers where they just happened to meet a celebrity at the commercial gym where they were working as a trainer. Right place, right time. Yeah. Yeah. And that actor came in to Crunch or Golds or wherever it was, Equinox, and they wanted a trainer and they happened to be paired with them. And when they went independent, that relationship was still there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get other trainers that hand you clients. And that's one thing that I would also recommend opening your mind to. If you develop really good relationships with other trainers and you stay open to learning constantly, then there's a decent chance that if they need someone to work for them Mm -hmm. or cover for them while they are off filming, training someone that's filming uh, for a new movie, those trainers need someone to watch their clients. And if you do keep a positive relationship with that person and you do prove that you are worthy and they can trust you, there's a possibility that you could be training some of these people. And I've had a couple of opportunities where because I have shown my intelligence, my patience, and my virtues that when they needed someone to cover, I got the chance. Mm. And that's how I've gotten some opportunities that I would not have otherwise. Yeah, that's awesome. Just the network aspect of bringing Mm -hmm. more people into your life that have the potential to actually impact you in a positive way. Um, And people are afraid of it. Yeah. It's it's weird. Um, I feel like as a kid, you know, we, we were always told to ask questions, but we never did mm-hmm. because we were always afraid of it. We were like, I don't want to ask a stupid question. I don't want to be made fun of or anything like that. But the people who are most successful in any industry are the ones who ask the questions. And obviously I can see that you're doing it right now. And it's just, it's awesome to see it progressing already in the short time that I've known you and the research that I've done on you. And I'm like, okay, like she's I for real. I can say that me moving here mm-hmm. And doing what I've done in four years, yes, I was in my late 20s when I moved here. So in terms of who I am as a person, I've obviously grown Mm -hmm. as you do, but I wasn't 22. So I was a bit more solidified in who I am as a human and a woman. So I just wasn't solidified who I was as a business person, right? So over time, because of the openness I've had to asking questions and yeah sometimes feeling stupid I ask stupid questions but saying okay cool I'll, I'll work on it and then I go right to it and mm-hmm. I improve myself and I do what I'm doing because of that and me humbling myself and not letting my ego get in the way yeah I've been able to do more in four years than some people have done in 10 so I would say keep yourself an open book and it doesn't mean that if someone suggests something if you disagree with it that's fine but at least still try Right. You know, mm-hmm. at least have an option, uh, a book that you can open. Yeah. I want to segue into being at the gym and being a trainer because I found this when I was training at the gym, like my own personal time at the gym was difficult to separate between client training at the gym. So how are you able to manage that where you're like, okay, this is client time versus this is my time and not get tired of going to the gym? So... I didn't do this until this past year, I would say 2022, Mm -hmm. but I would recommend working out in a different location than where you train your clients. Okay. Or now after COVID, there are several different gyms you can train your clients at. I do have three places that I train my clients. They're all nearby, Mm -hmm. but I don't mind doing a little bit of traveling just to make sure that they're comfortable Mm -hmm. and happy. But I have one place that I work out. I have one client I bring there. But I have my people around and my friends and other trainers and everything. So I get my time and I don't feel like 
I'm being watched or working out at the same time as a client. It is a little weird. Mm -hmm. it, and it's, it's distracting because they'll want to ask for help or they'll say hi or right. they'll watch you. And you're like, oh, I have to be a good role model right now while I'm working out. And they are. Yeah. You want to have your own mental space to do whatever the heck you want to do. Listen to what music you want to do. Take your time or push it. Whatever you want to do. So I suggest finding a space that's for you that's somewhat separate from where you work. Yeah. I never thought about it that mm -hmm. way. Also, I also am not training anymore, yeah. but I did it on accident. Uh -huh. Um, also. I just had clients that I had a private studio space and then I had another gym where they said, well, I don't want to be in the private studio anymore. I want to be around other people. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Cool. Let me find a gym that I think fits your vibe. Sure. Found one down the street. Didn't always add up with my vibe where I like to work out. Right. Mm -hmm. So I ended up bringing one client over to this place and I thought, wow, this is really nice to not have my clients in here working out at the same time as me or to not have to worry about running into people. And I loved having my own space because if I wanted to take two hours to work out and go really slow and take my time and mess around, I could do that and I didn't have to worry about judgment. How are you able to maintain those client relationships? I think the best thing is creating healthy boundaries. You are their trainer. Mm -hmm. You can be a support for them to listen, to try to understand, but you do need to be careful with how close. I have clients where I may have had them for three years now. So over time, yeah, they end up learning a little bit about my personal life. Also on Instagram, I'm much more open about my personal life, but there are always things that we do in our personal lives, personal relationships with people where I've thought, Wow, if they knew how I was doing with my love life, for example, <laughs> would they still admire me as a trainer? It's a silly question, but if you're really off in one area, everyone has growth. But imagine if you knew a little too much about your hairdresser, you might wonder, are they even paying attention to how they're cutting my hair right now because they just went through a breakup and they're dealing with blah, 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 blah. Right. Right. So you don't want to know too much. Mm -hmm. So the first piece of advice is to figure out your healthy boundaries and what you would want from a trainer if you were a client. So to create the support, you want them to feel safe, regardless of gender. You want your client to feel safe with you. You want them to feel listened to. Even if they say something and you don't really, it's a silly exercise and there's no purpose to it. If that's something they wanna learn and something they wanna do, then teach them. Mm -hmm. It's not always what you want. It's a mix of what you want and a mix of what they want right? You can mix in an exercise that's going to improve their mobility while also giving them something that they saw on Instagram that looked just visually entertaining. I, I like that. You know, mm -hmm. just, all right, let's it's do fun. some, let's do some glute ham raises or presses and stuff. Exactly. You can see moves on Instagram where I'm like, wow, there is no, why do you have a band? <laughs> why are you wearing a band around your, your knees during this move? There's no reason to do that. <laughs> and then they're like, well, I want to do exactly this one. It's like, okay. But I will tell you as a trainer mm -hmm. that if we wear the band during this exercise, I would probably advise not to wear the band because there's no point to wear it. Um, so there's, there's different ways that you can educate and find things in the middle and then sometimes just do something that's fun. Not every exercise has to have a purpose as long as it's not going to put them in danger. If they get bored with, especially general population, if they get mm -hmm. bored with an exercise, fine, then make it more interesting because... I would say progression in a, in a movement. We know split squats is the same move every time and all you do is progressively overload. Yeah. That can get really boring for some people. It does. <laughs> yeah. And it can get boring for me. So sometimes I'm like, cool, maybe I want to try this one. Make it fun, but also keep it effective. Working out is supposed to be cool. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people don't do it, which is a surprise. So definitely get the band or around your knees or take it off uh, yeah. because you saw it on Instagram and it helps to activate your glutes. Yeah. Oh, it's so nice. Yes. Yes. Makes the booty bigger. That's what everybody envisions when they're working out with a, with a band. Or because they have you want your client yeah. to learn. And of I now course. have my clients where they're in a space, even with working in three sessions, they mm -hmm. could be trying a workout on their own for the very first time. They're right. like, oh, I 
saw this girl or this guy over there doing this exercise. And I remember, I get it now. Right. It doesn't make sense that they were doing this, this, and that. Mm -hmm. Right? So they also learn and you find fun things to do together that are also effective for them. Even if it's not, it doesn't have the exact purpose. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's, it's just fun. Yeah. How have you been able to grow your personal branding? So I have always even since moving here, I'm a social media person. Mm -hmm. So I'm very open on my page um, within reason. I do not just keep it workouts all the time. Mm -hmm. You're going to see my cats on my story. You're going to see me talk about really funny Botox things. Like right now, if I smile, this eye doesn't close as much. And mm. I thought it was really funny because it means just the Botox like worked on this part and it didn't work very well here. Mm -hmm. Things like that, like you can talk about really funny stuff. And I think because I'm super open, people want to work with me because I'm fun mm -hmm. and I am myself and I don't have this perfect business attitude where I, div right. I don't take away my personality. Right. So I've grown my brand by creating social media that represents my knowledge, mm -hmm. of course, my aesthetic, but also my personality. I want people to know me. I want to feel understood as well as a person. I am a person. So other than social media, I've also used Yelp. That has really helped. And having good reviews mm -hmm. um, makes a big difference. So I ask all of my clients, I'll send it, hey, could you just do a little thing thing here? Yeah. You know, and then you have someone else look, oh, whoa, that was from like a month ago. I'm going to contact her, mm -hmm. right? And then you have a website, right? And not as many people rely on the website now as they used to, more so these days at social media and Yelp. You also have TikTok. So looking at all of the social media channels, I try to use what I can. I try to use Yelp for other people that don't use social media. There's Facebook, mm, not as not used as often. It depends on what population you want to work with. Mm -hmm. So branding wise is definitely online for me a lot. I these days it's just not so much of handing out cards. I mean, let's be real. You hand out cards, people don't really keep it. No. But if you happen to meet someone and you say, "Oh yeah, I'm a trainer," and they're like, "Oh okay, let me see your Instagram." Yeah. Look at the Instagram. It's not just the following. It's the presentation. They're like, oh, my God, mm -hmm. that's cool. You look really cool. They watch you for a little bit, and then you get the DM. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I call that the, um, you know, almost like your first impression, but you have to pass the first barrier of entry, which is ju just the credibility, yeah. you know, and that's the social media, which is, okay, the followers, the likes, how, how often are they posting? Mm -hmm. And that's what I also want to talk about is how are you able to stay so consistent mm -hmm. with your posting online? And r run me through that process. Well, this definitely gets a little more personal. Mm -hmm. um, but I was diagnosed with ADHD in the past eight months. And I had a lot of issues as a kid, socially and functionally and all these things. So I have struggled for, what, I'm 31, so at least 30 years of my life with being, my brain was working at a high speed, but no production was coming out of it. I was just overwhelmed with plans and thoughts and inspiration and I'd get fixated, but then it would stop because I'd be like, oh, well, that's a lot. Yeah. I can't do this. So I would say for me, what has helped me stay organized is taking a day or two or splitting it into different moments throughout the week of planning what I want to post what I want to post, what do I want, to, how do I want to present myself? How do I want to be seen, right? Mm -hmm. And then of course you have the freaking algorithm to work with. And sometimes it doesn't work well. Right now I'm in a weird phase. I post a reel and it's just not getting the views it was. I don't know what it is. You just have to stay consistent no matter what. So thinking about taking maybe a Sunday and planning out two reels a week and a picture. Bring right. it down into a calendar. I mean, I, I want to know what kind of like softwares are you using too for that? Or are you just doing it manually? So this I think is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And this is something I want to make a reel on, but haven't done it yet. Um, Put it in the calendar. I know, I know. And I'm like, just do it. Yeah. But this would be a great segment, mm -hmm. uh, this little portion here. So when you're looking on Instagram specifically, mm -hmm. especially for the millennial generation, 
Um, you're looking at very nice content for some of these fitness videos. The trainer or the person who's working out is very present. Everything else behind them is blurred out. Right. Nice colors. Uh, nice. Uh, just the aesthetics of everything that's happening. I don't even care what they're saying. I'm like, I just want to look at your face and your skin. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So we're now getting into this whole phase and you're going to see it more and more. People are buying actual cameras. Yeah. Right? So my recommendation is the Sony A7 III or IV. Mm -hmm. I did get the two. Fine if you have to, but if you can get the three or four, it's better. Yeah. And getting a 50 millimeter or a 35 millimeter lens. If you have a lot more money, you can get one that ranges in different lenses, right? Mm -hmm. You could do a like 35 to 70 millimeter. If you don't have all that money, get the base camera and get a 35 or a 50 millimeter lens. Boom. Yeah. That's all, that's all we're doing. So quality content, something that's visually appealing. And once I've done that, it took a lot of hours of just practice, but planning on what you want to film. I just start to film random exercises constantly. got better at setting everything up. And so now when I want to make a reel, I can kind of go back through all my content and be like, oh, this fits that. Right. Let me use this. And you put it together. And even if you didn't pre-plan exactly what the reel is, you can throw something. Mm -hmm. Something is there, right? So definitely using that, or if you want to use your iPhone, that's also fine. Just use quality camera content. Yeah. Are you using any publishing softwares to help <sighs> you out or are you doing manual? Well, actually, it's funny you say that because I started to, this is another example of being humble and asking people mm -hmm. when I see other trainers that have stuff and I'm like, I, my stuff doesn't look like that. How do they do that? Or that transition isn't not like on the Instagram app. Right. How do they get it to boom, boom, and all these other things that are happening, right? I just message them and say, hey, what'd you use to edit this? I'm getting a lot of Final Cut Pros in any kind of Adobe editing software. Mm. Um, outside of that, if you really want your content to look the best, you, you can use what Instagram provides, which I've done that now several mm. times. But I would definitely say... People are learning. It's like back in the day we had MySpace. I could code HTML. Really? Oh, yeah. We all knew how to code HTML. Yeah, we did. I know. <laughs> cool like, kids on the block. <laughs> they'll all agree with that. We yeah. knew how to code HTML. We could do all these little like bold slash movement action sequences yeah. on our MySpace. So we, we're <laughs> getting... My MySpace. MySpace. What's up? Yeah. So now we're back in a phase where we're getting our own cameras, we're getting our own lenses, and now we're learning how to edit software. And I think the next thing is going to be learning how to color. Color grade? Yeah. Mm. See? I don't even fully understand that. Yeah. But we're learning, we're, we're learning all of these things. So mm -hmm. we're using professional software to do um, our presentation. It's, it's just getting more. TikTok, very different. iPhone, editing on TikTok yep. or a third-party app. So TikTok... I would say lower quality, easier to make. You can flip through all kinds of videos. Mm -hmm. Instagram, you're looking at more, where it's more challenging, I think. And I like it. Mm -hmm. It's more visually appealing. It's more millennial based. Gotcha. And what are some of the uh, expenses that you've had hmm. that you weren't prepared for when you got into the industry <laughs> where you were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm about to spend this money, but I, I kind of have to. Yeah. The first thing is, if you're working in an independent gym, you're taking your clients there, you have your own business. You could lose twenty to twenty-five dollars a session, in LA at least. So if you're charging a hundred dollars an hour, you're keeping seventy-five. Yeah. That doesn't always feel great, no. right? No. You can buy a package of sessions. You can buy unlimited for the month. You'll probably start with a package. If you buy fifty sessions, it could take you down to fifteen dollars a session, but you have to pay all of that up front. Right. There goes seven hundred and something dollars. Mm -hmm. Right. So those big payments up front, you'll make it back, yeah. but it could take four months, right. five months, right? To go through that many sessions. So definitely session packages. That was, that was an expense. Second thing is workout clothes. Mm. And you can spend $600 like I just did and get five outfits, Yeah. but then you go through five days of the week and you're like, what? I just wore this. Yeah. Like, how can I afford a whole other pack of freaking workout clothes? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So definitely the clothes, the aesthetic of who you are. Um, another expense would be 
obviously a camera. Yeah. When people start to ask me how much that was, my camera, because it's the Sony a7 II, is like $1,600. That's low. That's cheaper. Mm-hmm. The lens, $800. More, more lenses $800. Are crazy. Yep. You're looking at Sony a7 III or four. You're looking at $2,200, $2,300 and up from there. Mm. So that can be overwhelming. Oh, I can't do that right now. Yeah. Right. But then you also have this, what, $1,000 iPhone. Yeah. That's fine. You got that, mm-hmm. right? You have mics that you have to buy. There's there's other little things that you learn along the way, yeah. right? But I would say all of this, even though it seems like a lot at once, it's building you. Mm-hmm. It's building your brand. And there's going to be a nice period of time where you are spending everything that you're making. You're not going to be saving because you're building who you are. The foundation work. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you have a mentor, it won't be as taxing. Yeah. But I would say for me, I've not really been able to save much in four years. Mm. Whereas if I was able to sit down with someone and I was able to coach them, yeah. I could probably do 50% of the time. I'd get them there in two years. Yeah. What's the pipeline of clients that you have, whether they're almost like on a waiting list for you or people that are just DMing you because... There becomes a point where you can't take on any more clients. Mm -hmm. And I know that you already have a packed schedule of clients that you already work with and managing those relationships because they're in-person relationships is so difficult and it's taxing on your brain. It's taxing on just your soul. So how are you going to attack bringing new people on where you have more clients to take on, where you have more time maybe dedicated to Mm -hmm. the work and you're not pulling your hair out with everything that's going on. I do somewhat believe in putting kind of an energy out there. Mm -hmm. So you can always tell if you're in a social environment and someone is open to talking, getting to know new people, ask about you, learn about you, or explain themselves. Yeah. Open to dating, not open to dating. Are they single or are they taken? You can always just kind of tell by someone's energy, right? Mm Mm-hmm. So I will say when I have put the energy out there, posting more, maybe it's the way I talk to people. Maybe I'm more open to presenting myself and what my job is instead of just talking about my personality Mm -hmm. when I'm looking for more clients. I think one thing that I was told but was still hard to grasp is that as a trainer, when you own your own business, clients, it's not like they sign up and they're like, 10 years. It could be six months. It could be three. It could be two weeks. It could be two years, right? So you don't always know how long somebody's going to be with you. Your job as a trainer is to train them so that they can be on their own and grow. Unless they have a ton of money and they're like, I can grow but still pay you to be here. Right. Also great, right? Yeah. So other than energy, I would definitely say it depends on what your price is. I'm the kind of trainer where I charge a little bit less. Because I have more retention, my clients stay with me longer because they can afford me long term. Instead of charging more, they buy a package and then maybe they can't afford the next one. So I have clients that I've worked with for two years. Sometimes they leave for a month or two and then they're like, oh, wait, I do need you, right? Yeah. Yeah. So finding more clients, it can come from social media. It can come from referrals. Which are huge. And you know... What's interesting is for me, mm-hmm. most of my clients are not referrals. Really? Well, you threw me for a loop there. Uh-huh. Wow. Most of them are not. Um, a lot of my clients have just naturally come from Instagram. Okay. Um, huh. But I was putting the, like right now, I haven't had any new clients ask for two or three months. Mm. And I'm like, okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because I'd probably say yes. And right. it might be a little too much. Yeah. Um, but... Once I start putting the energy out there and I start maybe putting things on my story like, are you ready for summer? Right. Things like that. So there are going to be times when things are going to be slower. December, weirdly, sometimes February or March. So there will be slower times and there will be other times when things pick up. But that's where, you know, financial management and all that comes in. There will be clients that leave and they come back a year later. I have two clients coming back, haven't seen them for three years. Wow. So I would say overall, 
It's the energy that you put out there in person, online, whatever. The clients that I do have from referrals, it's usually because they see them posting on social media. Mm -hmm. They're like, I want to look like you, or I love your relationship with your trainer. Or you even telling clients like, hey, listen, I'm open to having more spots. And if you know anyone that would be interested, I will give them your pricing. So a referral where there's a benefit. Right. So when you're ready, give yourself like a good month to start kind of putting the energy out there to add some more people on. Nurturing. Yeah. Just but nurturing. if not, then use your whatever time you have and like give yourself the, the, yeah. the capacity. Yeah. I want to go into just being a female in the industry mm -hmm. because <laughs> it's very sexualized. It's very... It's very skin tight. That's yeah. the word I would use. It's very skin. Yes. Um, it's not bad, mm -hmm. but I would highly recommend to any woman that I meet mm -hmm. that's wanting to work in the industry or has or is branching off on their own, figure out exactly how you want to represent yourself. Not forever, but at least for now. There are some women who choose to go the more sexualized route, which is totally fine, mm -hmm. where they're focusing on the sexiness of a woman and feminism and, you know, maybe building your booty and doing stuff. And, and women go to that. And that's yeah. great. I think that's wonderful. Then there are others who go the more educational route. And there's not a lot of skin that's showing. They're talking about glutes, but in more of a muscular way mm -hmm. than like a sexual way. Some people are a hybrid. So as a woman, we have to use our tool belt yeah. as always. It is mostly a male-dominated area. So the fundamentals of what any woman has to deal with as we, you know, women, you, you ladies, you understand... You do have to apply that in any setting. Don't do anything that you are uncomfortable with doing. Of course, there's the whole aspect of your clients. And if your clients are male, um, like I take on male clients absolutely, usually through referral. Mm -hmm. I'm a little more comfortable. Um, but I don't meet in, in a secluded place. Sometimes I FaceTime first. I don't even want to meet in person. Um, I don't even have our first consultation mm -hmm. being the first time I've actually had any kind of visual of this person. Yeah. Um, so you do need to be careful. There is that part. But then there's also the other aspect of how you want to represent you. Um, so I've chosen more of the hybrid situation. I love the I love the femininity of a woman. I love the sexuality of a woman, the sensualness. I love all of it. But then I also love the aspect of intelligence and education. And so I kind of blend both of them without going too far in either direction. But that took me a while to figure out and that aspect comes from just growing up yeah. and getting older and figuring out uh who you are as a woman that's awesome mm -hmm. i mean just life experiences in that area and figuring out some of the ethical mm -hmm. ways of personal training yes. and have you had any issues with that during your mm -hmm. times yeah um and i'm sure this won't come as surprising to many women but yeah i've been in a, a place where I was being what I could consider sexual harassment mm -hmm. um, in the workplace. And I didn't know how to handle that. I didn't know how to say stop. I didn't even know, is it called that? Is that what I could say it is? Or how do I create these boundaries? Right. So yeah, it is a learning process. But I've definitely had issues with certain men, um, other trainers, that have been too forward or too dominant in the workspace where I was didn't feel respected. Um, or I was spoken to differently because mm -hmm. I was in an environment where I was the only female on the team and I wasn't treated. Yeah. I wasn't even treated really with respect. It wasn't about equality. I just wasn't treated with respect. Mm. Um, so, yeah, being realistic, there's going to be – that stuff's going to – it's going to show itself. If you're a woman, just be prepared for some sort be of encounter. Be prepared. It's not a fight. Right. But once you, you know, we are all here for each other, mm -hmm. it helped me so many times when things were said to me that were inappropriate and I had a, a girlfriend that was nearby that was like, uh, what did you just say? <laughs> because if that's not yeah. in my personality and I didn't feel comfortable doing that, I had someone to support me. I had someone to talk to. Um, 
there's also not only the issue with the, the work environment, it is also, like I mentioned, with certain clients. So I do say don't go in with the expectation of anything bad. Don't go. I don't want you to feel scared, mm -hmm. but you do need to be real about it. Like, yes, this definitely exists. If I'm working in an environment where it's mostly men, mm -hmm. get ready. Yeah. You know, it's not a fight. It's just like, you know, did they mean it that way? Probably. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but I think that also comes with we deal with that outside of work. It's like just don't think that work is any different. Right. Now, what are some of the key qualities that you would say makes a great personal trainer? Not a good personal trainer. A great one. A great personal trainer. Definitely being open to learning. You okay. do not know it all. Mm -hmm. You're not going to know it all. You haven't done everything. And that's okay. There are so many different areas and so many beautiful places that trainers can go in terms of how they approach it. training any client. Mm -hmm. So I think a great personal trainer would be someone who is open to learning and trying new things, changing with the times. Second, listening to your client and what they want and trying to find a healthy balance between what they're looking for and what you know is actually realistic for them and safe and not just what you want, mm -hmm. but, but really listening to your person and making sure that they feel understood and they feel safe and welcome. Another thing is if you're having a conversation with another trainer or you're reading something on social media and it's do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, or you're arguing about how an exercise should be done, just remember there is no wrong exercise. Yeah. It may not be as productive or it could be dangerous but it's not always wrong, right? So we have this egotistical environment where you see a movement done by another trainer. Why did they have their client do that? And it's right. like, well, maybe there isn't a reason and their client was bored and wanted to have more fun movements. Sure. Who knows? Or maybe you know that they're not doing it the most productive way. What are you going to do? Right. You know, like run into the gym, stop it. No. <laughs> So being open to just letting people do their thing, being open to learning, being open to understanding your client and what they're wanting, but also doing your little check-ins to say, hey, do you feel, yeah. how do you feel? We, are we on a good path here? I want to check in with you and see how you're feeling about the program. Are you liking things? Please just tell me anything. Yeah. I, I, want, to, I want you to feel good about this, right? So check-ins is a huge thing, and I forget to do it myself. Mm -hmm. Until I'm in a situation with a health professional and I'm like, hey, yeah. it's been a month. Wanted to check in to see how I'm doing, you yeah. know. So I definitely think it's the openness of, of your personality and willingness to learn. You got a good personality, so yeah. it, it fits what you're doing. And it took awesome. me a little bit to be yeah. open to learning more because I was in a place where I was like, why are they doing that? And it's like, Morgan, stop. <laughs> you don't need to know why yeah. it's not you know not that it's not my business it's just like maybe there is something there that you missed right and you can also learn from stuff oh like my that. gosh yes i've seen so many movements done where i'm like why are they doing it that way that's not right and then i end up talking to them and they show me a completely new perspective of the same move that i've been doing and i start applying that to my own sessions with my own clients two sides of the coin yep yeah gotta be uh observational and then educated mm -hmm. on what you're doing so. get rid of the ego yeah get rid of it what are some things that you wish you did before or even that you wish you did differently uh when you were getting started in personal training make sure you have your your website and your uh goals set up with social media if that's the route you want to take you mm -hmm. don't have to take that route but i wish i had um spent more time like I was like oh I need a website and I didn't really put that much effort into it right I tried to do it myself and then I was like ah oh, it's ADHD stuff and I'm not gonna do this paid somebody to do it but didn't really know what I wanted so I looking back I really needed to just know what I wanted to be seen as a personal trainer mm. how did I want to represent myself I didn't really know so I was just throwing out stuff and kind of copying what other people were doing so figure out for yourself and number two find a mentor or several I, I was a little afraid to, like we talked about earlier, being intimidated. When I first started, I thought, uh, I'm on my first year of doing this. And these people have been doing this for 10 years, 15 years. 
find a couple people that are willing to talk to you. So you don't put all your pressure on one person, but ask all the questions in the world. Some people are willing to help a little bit. Some are willing to completely help a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So definitely figure out how I wanted to represent myself, finding mentors and people I could talk to and look up to. And then I would definitely say setting up, for example, like a contract for your business. You need to have, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, liability stuff. Get all that set up. And if you don't know how, talk to other people that have done it. I even had um, a gym owner who had been in the training industry for like 30 years. He let me use his old contracts and I use that base because it's just a contract. Right. So I use that base to create my own. There are people out there that will help you. And that saved me hours of work that yeah. I would have had to do. Um, so have your contract set up and figure out what you would want to be pre presented as a client. So as I would bring on clients, I wanted a welcome packet. That was kind of nice, nothing overwhelming. But I want you to ask me questions about myself and I want to mm -hmm. have to think about it and write it out. So having your paper set up that when somebody comes on board, they want to feel like, oh, wow, I'm special. I get this, yeah, great contract, but I get this welcome <laughs> packet and I get to read this and yeah. I get to do all these things. So kind of set everything up for yourself. Um, I, I didn't have a lot of that and I started building it along the way. And if I had just had all my stuff together, it's like creating a school project. Yeah. Your project is due on this date. You need to have X, Y, and Z done. Just get all that together and then you can improve it as you go along instead of just like picking up scraps yeah. as you learn. Yeah. What's some of the best advice that you were given uh, by a mentor or even somebody outside that you took into personal training? Um, definitely putting yourself in a space where uh, people are better than you. Okay. Should right. be better. Yeah. It, you, you should. Um, even if it's just one other person. Mm -hmm. Having someone to look up to, continuously wanting to learn and build. I think I was very judgmental but it came from insecurity mm -hmm. as a trainer and as a human. But when I was told, just, just re chill, <laughs> chill, listen, learn and be open, listen, learn and be open. Those qualities had come from someone who has been through everything that I was going through. Yeah. So yeah, just, just chill, mm -hmm. just listen. That's it. Yeah. That helps so much. And then you're not, living every day as a fight to yeah. prove yourself to people that really don't care. Sure. Is there any last final remarks that you would love to tell somebody who's of the younger generation, they want to get started in personal training, or maybe they just are a client and mm -hmm. they should probably ask their personal trainer something that might be beneficial? Yeah. I think, you know, the first part is as a client, you should feel feel comfortable, safe, and understood. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't know that you're not happy or that you have questions or that, man, I wish, I wish she would ask me this. Please tell us if you don't like a movement and it hurts or you're going down a path and maybe you didn't want this much muscle, you wanted more toning, like, please tell us. Yeah. So I always recommend to anyone that has a trainer and they make any complaints to me. I'm like, well, did you tell them? Yeah. Like, well, no. Okay. I'm sure my own clients would be like, yeah, you could probably check in on me more and say this and this and mm -hmm. this. So please know that you, your trainer is working for you. Right. Right. So they're working for you and what you want. So you should feel like you're getting what you want. Mm -hmm. Right. Just like you would with any other health professional. Now as a trainer, someone who wants to be a trainer I would definitely say you, you're not going to just jump into the industry and have your own business and have a bunch of clients. Mm -hmm. If you have a ridiculous amount of money or like your parents are going to pay for you or whatever it is, then sure, that would be great. You don't really need to work at a commercial gym, right? Yeah. Um, you would have all your resources there. But if not, you need to give yourself some time. I think a lot of people that are younger now, even in the Gen Z, uh, in the Gen Z space, are wanting to just get to the middle right away. Yeah. And in the personal training industry, you're building yourself as a brand. So you need to give yourself a couple years. Um, if you want to get a degree in this, 
get your certification as a trainer Mm -hmm. while you're getting your degree and start practicing training people if you want to get a head start and feel productive. Start doing all the things that I named earlier while you're in school. Mm -hmm. Um, But be patient with yourself and be open to learning. You're not going to just be able to build a whole business overnight because these are human beings that you're trying to work with. This is not just people clicking a sign-up button. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a journey. Don't be too hard on yourself. Be patient with yourself. You know, I'm 31. Mm -hmm. I didn't move to L.A. until I was 27, going on 28. That was late in my mind, and I hated it. And I was so mean to myself but it ended up working just fine because that's just how it was meant to be right you know yeah just learn yeah take everything into account um kind of do check-ins yeah which maybe you could do a little bit more of yeah it sounds like you're convincing yourself of. yeah absolutely so, yeah i think there's a lot that people just need to learn mm-hmm. you know and you you hit the nail on the head of we Gen Zers just want it now and yeah. the instant gratification, which is understandable. Everybody does. And y'all get there though. Yeah. Because a lot of the people that I'm working with now that are doing websites and doing podcasts mm-hmm. and doing all this stuff, that's not millennials. Yeah. That's Gen Z. Yeah. And I have several Gen Z clients and I'm like, whoa, you're doing that at like 24. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't even know what I was doing. Exactly. So yeah. it's great to see. It's also like chill. Mm-hmm. You know, also enjoy being yeah. the age that you are and, and learning because if I can do this, right, mm-hmm. then you'll, you'll be totally fine. Yeah. yeah. Where is the place that people can go to if they have any questions, concerns, they just want to get into contact with you? Maybe they want to have you train them. Where, yeah. where do they go? So the best place to reach me is always Instagram mm-hmm. at Morgan Reese Fit, R-E-E-S-F-I-T. So that's the best place. Send me a DM. I look at my stuff every single day, all the time. You can just creepily watch my stories until you get comfortable to message me as well. I don't care. Either is fine. Another uh, possibility, if you want to email me, it's morganreesfit at gmail.com. That's also fine. Um, I'm very open to talking to new people and uh, doing virtual calls to, I want you to feel as comfortable as possible. So. Please do not hesitate or feel awkward or uncomfortable just sending me a DM. I I love just I love meeting new people and getting to know people regardless of, of where we go with it. Awesome. And also MorganReesFit.com. Yes. Definitely go there because the website was hard worked at. <laughs> yeah, I know. And we got more work to do. So yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming yeah, on the show thank today, you. Morgan. Um yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. These episodes are completely and 100% free for you to watch and listen to. So if you could please go share it, like it, comment, subscribe, I don't know, whatever channel platform you're on, please just help us out a little bit. And in return, we will continue to bring high quality and awesome content for you and your ears. Thank you.